Hello and welcome to the Argus Hydrogen and Future Fuels podcast. This month we are speaking to companies involved in the liquid organic hydrogen carrier scene or the LOHCs. Joined today colleagues from Chioda uh, and Hydrogenus. Uh, we have Ekeda and Andreas uh, from the pair of them. So, gentlemen, your companies are, are viewed as the leading proponents of LOHC technology. Uh, it's a great treat to get you both onto the podcast, and thank you for coming. Uh, our, our listeners are all well aware that hydrogen is a devil to transport um, because it's so diffuse and it has a large volume. And the solution that you both propose involves binding hydrogen to a carrier molecule and then transporting that hydrogenated liquid then releasing the hydrogen at the receiving end. And the carrier chemical will then gets back, sent back again to the source for rehydrogenation before returning once again for dehydrogenation in an ongoing loop. So neither of you are alone. Uh, your, your companies aren't alone in looking at this route. Could you give a, a brief overview of the carrier that you're using and the level of technology readiness that you sit at? And I'll ask you first, uh, Ikeda-san. Yeah, thank you. LOHCs are able to storage and transport hydrogen under ambient conditions. And also it is easily and safely and economically handle hydrogen at liquid phase by using uh, existing oil and chemical infrastructure, such as tanks, lorry, tanker, pipeline, truck, etc. Successfully demonstrated global hydrogen supply chain by using uh, LOHC MCH technology from Brunei Darussalam to Japan uh, in 2020. That was the world's first global supply chain project. And just recently, we also have successfully completed its global supply chain demonstration by using chemical uh, tankers. That means it is ready for the commercial at scale. Excellent. Thank you. So ready for commercialization. And uh, Andreas, could, could you tell us yeah, where you sit at level of readiness uh, and the carrier that you're using as well? Yes, yeah, definitely. So um, the carrier we're using is called uh, benzyl toluene which we have decided for because it's a, it's a very uh, stable and available uh, chemical that is being used. And in terms of readiness, um, I think uh, qu quite comparable to the colleagues, we are really looking at the industrial scale up. So we have multiple systems in the field uh, already currently. Um, one of our most recent projects is a hydrogen refueling station together with our partner H2 Mobility that is uh, serviced with LOHC. So we can use uh, the infrastructure of fossil fuel transport for our LOHC, and then we can um, provide that hydrogen refueling station with green hydrogen, uh, and the, the method of delivery is uh, our LOHC, and it's a commercial station where you can already today buy green hydrogen in the heart of Germany. And uh, quite similar um, uh, to the colleagues, we are looking to scale up to multiple tons per day systems where you really have massive industrial scale um, and to, to scale up even further. So our next project uh, in that field is coming uh, next year, where we are talking about five tons of hydrogen per day that are being stored. And that really shows that the technology is ready for industrial uh, application. Perfect. So when, when, when the hydrogen economy was in its infancy or in the early days, um, there was a lot of talk about um, LOHCs. Um, more recently, the public conversation has veered towards uh, ammonia as a vector. And there are instances of um, LOHC support, uh, as well as liquid hydrogen as well. But, but predominantly, the conversation tends to veer towards uh, ammonia at the moment. Can you, can you tell me a little bit about the projects that you're both involved in? Because we, we haven't heard so much about the LOHCs in recent years, uh, or, or recent months, I should say, probably, um, the last 12 to 18. Um, Ikeda, could, could you tell us a little bit about what Chioda is involved with projects today? Ah, okay, and uh, uh, as a LOHC project, so we focus to establish a global high supply chain at scale for both Asia and Europe. So in mm -hmm. Asia, uh, we have two focus uh, hydrogen demand center, one is in Japan and one is uh, Singapore. So we participate in the several projects in Japan and try to establish a global supply chain to import hydrogen from overseas to Japan. Uh, Chubu is the name of the region and uh, uh, they have the largest industrial zone in Japan. So we participate to its hydrogen demand consortium to support to establish global hydrogen supply chain in these regions. And in Singapore, so our relation has been started in 2020 uh, when we conclude the MOU with five Singaporean partners 
And just recently, recently uh, we have concluded MOU with Singaporean key UTD player, Semco, together with the Mitsubishi Corporation, to start a pre feed study toward a commercial operation start in 2026. Europe, so we have concluded MOU with Port of Rotterdam and Korea Terminal in last year to do the uh, joint study for importing hydrogen to European market by using LHM sheet technologies. And now we are under uh, shaping the project to identify the specific hydrogen off-takers in Europe and also the uh, supplier in global. So we are also doing several other projects uh, that is today it is difficult to uh, disclose, but the, uh, uh, soon we, we, we will uh, release. So uh, please wait for our uh, upcoming update. Yes. What about yourself, Andreas? Can you tell us a little bit about projects that uh, Hydrogenus is involved in today or getting involved in? Uh, yes, of course. Um, I mean, quite similar, you notice that the ports uh, are, of course, uh, playing a good role. So we are in contact with the with the European ports, also uh, in the Middle East. Um, we have just um, well um, sent out an MOU together with the port of Amsterdam, uh, which is very interesting, um, actually, to develop projects in Amsterdam, uh, because maybe also connecting back to, to the original question, why is ammonia in the focus and and not other things? And mm. there it's very interesting uh, if you talk about Amsterdam, they have banned ammonia in the port area because it is so unsafe. And I think that is a, a factor um, that is overlooked um, oftentimes currently that um, that the safety of ammonia of ammonia is is quite a high concern. So uh, it is very interesting that Amsterdam has banned it completely and is purely focusing on LOHCs as an import vector. Uh, for hydrogen. And, and that's to do with the, the population density surrounding the port as well, isn't it? Yes, that is correct. So the, yeah, the, the primary the, reason. <laughs> there, if something goes wrong in the port area, uh, then you immediately have people's lives in danger that are in close vicinity uh, of the port area. While, of course, in other areas where you have industrial settings and can safely handle the ammonia, uh, the concern is, is of course, less. Um, and mm. I mean, ammonia is being handled today. But I think what you have to see is the large amounts of ammonia um, that would have to be transported uh, to to have it as an as a hydrogen vector uh, is a different a different magnitude than what ammonia handling looks like today. Yeah. Another thing that we are looking at as Hydrogenius is a project from uh, from the Middle East where we are together together with Adnoc, with Jara, and uh, with Uniper, uh, a German utility company. Um, we already look into transporting hydrogen. Uh, 8,000 tons per year um, to Europe, which mm. would really show the connection between the Middle East and Europe and really shows a, well, a first um, supply chain of actually molecular hydrogen as an offtake, because that is the, the second contrast uh, coming back to your question. When we are talking ammonia transport today, then typically we are not actually talking hydrogen as the end product feedstock, but we're talking ammonia as the end product feedstock. And uh, in many industries- For direct use, you mean? Hydrogen. Exactly, for direct use, for fertilizers, yeah. for explosives uh, and, and similar things. And in some cases, uh, also co-firing of ammonia uh, is a topic. But uh, well, how, how I would um, evaluate that is, ammonia is currently in focus because it's the low hanging fruit. You can already do something with it and you have at scale uh, systems available. But it's not the solution if you're talking uh, molecular hydrogen feedstock in the end, because their um, development needs to be done for cracking ammonia and so on. And uh, I believe um, that LOHC is a better alternative there uh, if you want to do it safe uh, and reuse infrastructure that you already have. So when we look at ammonia, obviously it's it's not it's not a new new technology. Uh, the process is very well understood. Uh, Ikeda, are there advantages that you see um, LOHCs having over ammonia as a hydrogen vector? And of course, Andreas was touching on on some there, but are there any that you would point to um, as big advantages? Yes, so as a uh, uh, colleague already mentioned, the uh, uh, ammonia itself is the, uh, uh, suitable for direct usage, such as the uh, urea, ammonia industry fuel soak, and so some pollinations and ammonia is the straightforward solution and the commercial ready. On the other hand, so if we utilize ammonia as a hydrogen carrier, so we need to develop ammonia cracking technology at scale. 
So mm. this technology is still under development and require time for the commercialization. On the other hand, so LHC uh, it had uh, already been technically proven and a uh, realistic solution now as a hydrogen carrier, uh, especially for the uh, large scale supply chain, including uh, ocean transportation compared with other vectors. So LHC are able to repurpose the existing oil and the chemical infrastructure and as well as the existing code and standards. So that will lead to minimize the investment cost and also the uh, implementation schedule, including uh, legislations. So in addition, so we are able to safely handle hydrogen as a liquid form uh, from ocean to port, industrial zone, and also commercial and residential zone, so that we have already managed in the society for long term. So that is the uh, uh, oh. advantage uh, of the ROCs. So I suppose one of the other areas which is um, a, a more obvious direct competition then, if, if we're not talking about ammonia in direct use, uh, would be liquid hydrogen. Um, and obviously that's something which is being developed in terms of the uh, supply chains for that. But Andreas, do you see any advantages that LOHC has over, over liquid hydrogen as a vector for hydrogen itself? Yeah, actually massively. So, um, I mean, we need to be careful with the with the term liquid, right? Because it implies um, simple handling, which is true for the LOHC because it's LOHC can be handled like like fossil fuels today. It is as simple as diesel. It is ambient conditions, uh, super easy reuse of infrastructure. If you look at the liquid in liquid hydrogen, then we are talking cryogenic hydrogen, right? So we are talking mm. very very cold, uh, far below minus two hundred degrees cooling. Um, massive pressure. So um, it, it is super hard conditions to handle liquid hydrogen. You need cylindrical or spherical tanks. Um, you constantly need to cool um, and repressurize. So that makes handling very difficult. And that also means that the whole end-to-end -end infrastructure from the source to the sink needs to be built for the liquid hydrogen um, to deal with those um, very harsh conditions. Mm. So whole port infrastructure, whole transport infrastructure in between, everything that has to do with storage, with handling, is uh, new infrastructure. Whereas if you compare that to LOHC, where you can reuse a lot of the fossil fuel infrastructure that we have and that sometimes becomes obsolete going uh, into the future, um, is already there. So I think uh, LOHC can be quicker, can be cheaper, and can be much safer uh, in the end. And then with the harsh conditions of the liquid, it should also be mentioned that you have a constant uh, boil off, right? Because you can't mm. keep the hydrogen um, on these conditions. So you're you're basically losing hydrogen every minute that you're storing. While with the LOHC solutions, um, it, is, it is super because it's like storing diesel. You have no boil off while having ambient conditions. You can store underground, uh, you can reuse existing tanks which makes it much, much, much easier and uh, much simpler and also quicker uh, in a time to market and build building up of infrastructure sense. Yeah. And that's ambient conditions as well, isn't it? Uh, I think the boil off gas rate is between three and seven percent for uh, liquid hydrogen, which is quite significant on a on a long voyage. Um, am I right at thinking that um, LOHC is because it's storage at ambient temperatures, it's not it's not a consideration. It's more the it, it's more losses at point of dehydrogenation. Is that fair? Uh, yes, that is correct. And and basically the loss is very very minor, right? So the the valuable hydrogen that you have that you want to transport that you want to use in the end um, really reaches its destination. Well, right? right, right, uh, with with liquid hydrogen, uh, you're losing a lot. Uh, along the way so you're making a lot of the effort in vain so th there's one other vector of course that uh, we haven't discussed so we've talked about ammonia liquid hydrogen um we're talking about lohcs but the other is of course pipelines uh, and cost is the prime consideration there does and this is to either of you does lohc have any advantages over pipelines because that's always the go-to um obviously a repurposed pipeline is, is is the one that people would gravitate towards if they can um, but over a certain distance, people tend towards to look towards uh, pipelines. Does LOHC have any advantages over them? Yeah, maybe from my point of view, um, I would say a pipeline is, is always a good thing and a cheap way to transport hydrogen, but you have to have it, right? So uh, the <laughs> challenge with pipelines is, of course, um, 
that it's quite complex in terms of permitting, in terms of building, and it all takes time. So uh, if you look at the, the timelines in Europe that we see currently for building up a pipeline network, they are very ambitious, but it still takes 10 years until you have infrastructure at the ready. So I would say all the LOHC technologies can be much quicker than the pipelines. Yep. And of course, the pipeline is built from somewhere to somewhere. So uh, you're quite limited. So there, there will be many regions out there uh, which don't have any access uh, to a pipeline. And you'd also need to service them with hydrogen in the end, that they are not left out of the uh, of the economy. Yep. That being said, we are actually not looking at either pipeline or LOHC, but there's a powerful combination between the two. So uh, projects that we are doing uh, as Hydrogenius are really combining a local pipeline with, an, with a large release plan, for example, for hydrogen. And thereby you have a beautiful combination because you can get cheap hydrogen from overseas, bring it to an area where you need uh, um, the hydrogen, build a large release plant, and then distribute it with a local pipeline. So there's a strong partnership between pipelines um, uh, and LOHC possible. And I think it's a beautiful combination for import plus distribution uh, at a large scale. Um, is there a is there a upper limit on the amount of hydrogen that can be transported via LOHC? Uh, is it just is that based on the carrier alone, or I'm just curious as to yeah w whether you guys see uh, a natural limit on how much usage it could see? Technically speaking, so the uh, uh, depend on the demand, so the we are able to scaling up uh, the uh, project itself uh, by using LOHC technology. So uh, uh, I think the, uh, uh, we also need to consider the uh, not only the LOC, but also the other option need to be considered uh, uh, to establish the global supply chain, uh, including a pipeline. So kind of the coexist and also the uh, uh, co-development is also one of the key considerations. But the uh, LOC itself, it, the, uh, we are able to scaling up, yeah, uh, depending mm -hmm. on the uh, demand. I saw uh, there was, there was a, a point made earlier about you're transporting the the valuable hydrogen obviously uh in the lohc um and we made a distinction between direct use for ammonia and of course people are developing cracking technologies there's more and more companies that are looking at that today um which would be um, transforming it to more of a vector uh, usage do you you see clear optimal use applications uh for lohc so if, if there are people listening uh, who are developing projects are there some types of projects or usage which lohc is favorable um for use within yes um uh, from our uh, from my, my side so the uh, strong advantage of the uh, LOHC is the uh, able to transport hydrogen seamlessly and safely from ocean to the uh, island and also the from ship to the uh, barge train and truck so that will bring a strong benefit to establish global health supply chain network from large scale to the small scale of uh, distribution efficiently so in addition, so once we convert green electron or hydrogen molecule into the liquid, LOHC, it is uh, able to store it very large volume and also long term. And will be suitable energy storage solution to absorb fluctuation of supply and demand at monthly or seasonal or annual and multiple years. And also when the hydrogen become one of the major energy stream, so LOHC are able to stretch green electron or hydrogen molecule as a national energy strategic reserve, as same as oil. So that is the uh, 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 strong and optimal use of the uh, LOHC. Yeah. yeah, I can only second that actually. I mean, just, just making it a bit tangible, the beauty of the LOHC is that you're super flexible, right? So let's assume you have a port where you're importing large amounts of, of hydrogen bound in LOHC, you basically have a choice, right? You can release it in the port area. You can very easily reuse fossil fuel infrastructure to transport it wherever it's needed. You can reuse your tanker truck. You can use river barges. You can to use train containers. Uh, so you're very flexible to bring it wherever it's needed. You can combine it with local pipelines. And it's all at the cost of fossil fuel transport today, which is super cheap, super easy, and with assets that are already uh, there. So uh, I think that is the the beautiful combination that you're very flexible and you can cater to so many different use cases um, with simple permitting and with uh, safe properties.
Yes. So the, the the storage and the the safety are the key. What would you say USPs? Is it a network effect game? Um, this because obviously everyone's talking different vectors, different methodologies of moving things. Does one win out? Is it a Betamax versus VHS type situation, or is there is there space for all carriers to be able to do something um, in a market of this size that we're discussing? I think it's not only the size of the market um, there. I, I think that also warrants that there's different technologies, right? We need to build up that infrastructure and we need to decarbonize and the demand is is massive. So that alone warrants uh, various carrier technologies. But also apart from that, I mean, if I look, to, look at today's energy infrastructure, also there we have different means of energy carriers, right? We have gas, we have oil, we have even different diesel, um, uh, gasoline and so on. And the reason for that is because they all have their own advantages and their their niches or fields of application where they excel over others. So um, I think those both factors will lead to having a mix of technologies in the end um, where, where different technologies have their cost advantage, their handling advantage, their safety advantage, whatever um, is warranted by the use case you have. And on top of that, you have a massive market that really allows uh, various players, various solutions uh, to excel uh, in their own fields. So hydrogen by weight tops out at about 7%, I believe. So that's a lot of carrier being transported rather than hydrogen itself. So I, I guess that makes it hard to address shipping as a cost component because in the end, everyone's looking at the cost uh, of, of, of the method of, of carriage. Does that mean that you're both focused on on cost reduction efforts at both ends of the process? Because there's not much to be done in the middle, I, I think. Is it is it really the hydrogenation and dehydrogenation ends that you're looking to gain efficiencies in? Uh, and if so, are you making strides in those areas? Even though hydrogen by weight is around the six or seven percent, so volume base is uh, around by five hundred, and uh, it is able to stretch a liquid form under ambient conditions. And also are able to utilize existing commercial infrastructure for vessel and tanks. So that is able to minimize the cost of the transportation. And uh, for the evaluation of the cost, so it is also important to consider the cost through the value chain from upstream to downstream. So most cost intensive part in LOC is the heat for the dehydration. So we are trying to optimize the heat to integrate from hydrogen user applications such as gas turbine, fuel cell, and the industrial process that will lead to optimize the cost. If electricity price is reasonable, so electrical heating is also be one of the options. And for upstream, so hydrogen is an exothermic reaction, so that will generate the heat. So if we are able to utilize and add value on this heat, so this will also another option to optimize the cost. And in future, uh, uh, hydrogen production technology and hydrogenation process will be integrated as one process, such as direct MCH synthesis technology that is directly produced MCH from a green electron. And that is able to reduce cost drastically as well as the downstream applications. So LSG is the, uh, based on the chemical reaction that produce much more room to optimize the efficiency and the cost by process integration. So that is the uh, 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 much more uh, uh, benefit for the futures. Mm. So I suppose a part of that then would be, I think you've answered a bit of that, a large component or cost component is going to be the, the dehydrogenation uh, at the receiving end. Is there potential to actually avoid the dehydrogenation side of things? Various ways, right? So um, for for our carrier, for example, there exists a, a direct um, LOHC fuel cell, right? So you, you put in LOHC in a fuel cell and you get out electricity and and unloaded uh, benzyl toluene. Uh, that is something that works in theory and in general has a technology readiness level of three to four. But in the long term, uh, that can be a solution, right, to directly uh, mm. do that. And then as uh, Osamu san uh, described, of course, if you have a heat source available like a gas turbine, like steel making and so on on the release side, then you, you get that heat for free, right? So uh, this way, of course, you you reduce it uh, completely in the end. And of course, there are, there are various technologies and, and various ideas of how to further reduce the heat demand um, in the release in the on the release side um, to really 
uh, get rid of those needs. Uh, some of them include, for example, oxidizing the carrier uh, and then getting that heat for free and have to um, have to put in more hydrogen on the storage side. So there's various ways to do it. Um, but I, I think we need to be fair and open of saying um, there is still a lot that can be developed in a field of LOHC compared to a field of ammonia that you have around for 130 years. Yes, yes. So so there's two methods you're talking about, really a co-location with sources of uh, industrial heat um, for the dehydrogenation process and direct use, of course. Um, yes. So both promising, promising ways to look at things. And obviously, the modelling that's taken place to date has obviously been on uh, on the full chain, um, you know, hydrogenation, carriage, dehydrogenation. Um, but with that being such a large cost component, the dehydrogenation, that has, both of those options hold the potential to change the economics quite substantially, doesn't it? Uh, yes, of course. So uh, I did not, not, not say the uh, LHC are only option uh, for large scale, but the uh, LHC are able to play an important role uh, to a global supply chain at scale. So we have already demonstrated its cap capability for the global uh, ocean transportation from Brunei Dasan to Japan uh, by uh, using a conventional chemical tanker this year and have planned to deploy to commercial projects in Asia and uh, Europe as a reality. So to establish a large-scale supply chain network, so we should consider whole picture, including a large-scale ocean transportation and also the smaller distribution and storage, not one by one. So LHC are able to provide such seamless supply chain solutions to support the uh, service uh, scale and the global supply chain network. Yes, with so many offtakes being described uh, and FID being quite slow to come through, um, is it something that people have to know now what their carrier solution is going to be? Uh, yeah. So uh, regarding to this uh, uh, market view, uh, yes, we also the same uh, uh, time frame target. So uh, after 2030, so hydrogen market uh, will be rapidly, rapidly increase. So that means uh, we also need to well prepare uh, to start the uh, uh, commercial project around 2027 and 28. So uh, uh, regarding to the technology itself, so such heat integ integration uh, between the uh, uh, gas turbine and fuel cell or uh, industrial process. So this already a, a, a engineering basis, uh, not the technology that would require. So in the since the uh, 2026, uh, 7 and 8, so we are able to uh, utilize such uh, engineering uh, uh, activities, uh, uh, effort to uh, do the heat integration. And for the uh, direct fuel cell, I think this is a more future technology. So we also all try to accelerate its technology development toward the year 2030 or something. But the, uh, yeah, still early time. So uh, at this, uh, by this time, so we are doing the engineering uh, activities such as heat integration. Mm. And the reason I ask that, of course, is because there's been a lot of modelling exercises to date to work out where various vectors sit um, relative to one another. And a lot of them suggested that LOHCs might be marginalised towards smaller uh, size projects uh, and transporting at distances below 5,000 kilometres, uh, which may well be a commercially addressable market. Um, but obviously, with, with you both focusing on ways to ameliorate the dehydrogenation end um is it is that are you both looking to expand the size of the market for lohc is, is that a fair way of looking at things yeah i think that's fair for for all to say right so we are looking to really scale up the technology to have uh, more capacity and larger plants of course while maintaining also the smaller sizes because as i said before that's the, the future of the lohc to be so flexible. And uh, Tim, let me also maybe mention, if you're looking at all those studies that are coming out there, where by the way, LOHC is doing quite well in most of the studies and, and being very competitive to the other carriers, I think we will also see reality hitting the ground. If you're looking at those projects that are being developed right now, uh, oftentimes um, they realize while developing those projects, uh, that there's other factors that are not covered by the studies like required safety infrastructure like um, supply chain disruption protection right so you want to be able to operate your systems uh, also if you have a, a disrupted supply chain that we have seen of course over the the recent years how important that is and um, uh, i think people will realize how how easy and how flexible lohc um, is being there 
So of course, we are all active uh, participating in those studies, talking to, to customers, developing projects. But for the time being, I think um, if I look at the numbers, we have 700 hydrogen projects worldwide uh, announced. I was going to ask, um, obviously, you talked about sort of typologies or, or situations where LOHC um, is it, it ha has huge advantages. Are there particular types of consumer um, that this might the LOHCs might better suit than others? Uh, uh, LOHC is the uh, uh, provide a hydrogen molecule and uh, are able to provide hydrogen to uh, its optakers. So uh, time frame and also portfolio is different uh, for each country and region. So therefore, we need to analyze the uh, and identify the real demand for each. And as an example, so in Japan and Singapore, so power generation sector is one of the key enablers of the hydrogen market. And Europe will be more focused on the uh, uh, industry usage, such as refinery, chemical, and steel industry that we understand. And to optimize the economics of hydrogen, uh, scaling up is one of the key factors. And we think that it is important to establish large scale supply chain for such energy and industry customers at first. Then. Uh, expand its market uh, to the uh, more distributed demand, such as mobility, distributed power, and heat demand uh, to share such scaling made from the uh, commercial perspective. Yeah, understood. So um, we should probably wrap up quickly, but um, I wanted to ask very quickly, uh, without giving anything away from either end, uh, and I'll ask you first, Andreas, uh, are, are, you, are we expecting to see um, more announcements from, from hydrogen, uh, Hydrogenus next year? Um, in terms of collaboration and projects? Uh, of course we are. Um, so <laughs> I think the momentum is, is massive at the moment. Everyone can feel that. Uh, and we see things moving all over the world, right? With the Inflation Reduction Act in the US, with the development in Europe that has already been uh, massive and massively high. Um, action in the Middle East, we see the big oil majors there moving to action. Uh, and of course, also um, uh, in Asia, uh, movement is very high, especially in, in Japan, in Korea, in Singapore, as Samusan uh, uh, also uh, noted before. So, um, yeah, I, I think we can stay all tuned and there will be uh, um, massive announcements coming. <laughs> Ikeda, if I can try a um, the final question with you. Do you see uh, opportunities in 2023 for Chioda being more weighted towards America and Europe than, Austra uh, than Australia and Asia? Uh, uh, we, we think that the uh, uh, both is an important market, so Asia and Europe. And uh, yes, uh, uh, in the US, so recently announced the uh, IRA, so new uh, uh, government support mechanism. So this is uh, quite aggressively activ uh, activate the market. So we also are, are very interested uh, for such market. But on the, in Asia and Oceania, so Australia has been already announced the, uh, their national strategy, and also now a lot of uh, project is now uh, planned uh, in Australia uh, for the uh, uh, export and also domestic usage. So one of the key is the, uh, how the demand demand country it, it can be activated, uh, activated such a uh, business uh, of the hydrogen. So uh, one of the key factor is the uh, government uh, 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 policy and also support. So uh, now Japan also uh, starting the uh, serious discussion about the uh, hydrogen uh, uh, supporting mechanisms such as the uh, uh, CFD or other uh, um, uh, supporting mechanism. So if the this uh, mechanism is online, so uh, uh, AGM market also quite uh, aggressively accelerated. That is our view. Yeah, understood. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, Andreas and Nakeda, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, really appreciate you you coming on and uh, spending a little time to tell our, our listeners more about the liquid organic hydrogen carriers. Thank you very much. And Argus Hydrogen and Future Fuels will return.